Good evening. Welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Every week, EWTN invites me to uh, bring men and women into your homes to tell their story of how the Holy Spirit opened their hearts and minds to the beauty of the church. Some, are, some of the guests are those that never in their life considered the Catholic Church. Others uh, were running away, screaming, uh, maybe not wanting to follow the faith of their childhood but then through the mercy of God, they rediscovered it at some point for some reason in their life. And uh, that might represent our guest tonight. We'll find a little bit more about that in a moment. Ron Meyer, uh, revert, uh, for want of a better term, someone who's come back. He is, uh, to some of you who, especially on the radio, might uh, re recognize his voice. Ron Meyer is the uh, radio host of EWTN's Blessed, Blessed to Play. And he'll talk about that in a moment. He's also the EWTN Mid-Atlantic Regional Marketing Manager. So he's very much involved with EW. Ron, it's good to see you here. All these years, all the time that I've traveled down to, of course, we knew each other in Steubenville uh, years ago, but all the time I'd bumping you down to EWTN uh, whenever I was in town. It's good to see you, finally. Great to be here. To so get you behind the camera after all these years. Yeah, it's great to connect. It's a nice room you have here. You do great decorating. <laughs> well, thank you. It's the designers of EWTN as they design the, the sets at EWTN. Maybe before we get into your story, it might be good for you to tell the audience what you do for EWTN, both in terms of your work for EWTN as well as your radio program. Yeah, sure. You know, I've been regional marketing manager for 12 years now. Yeah. And basically, I work with cable systems trying to get the network on. And we've been blessed to have carriage in mostly every cable system within yeah, the United States, amazing, and of yeah. course, internationally as well, too. But I also work on the grassroots level, building awareness of EWTN through our many supporters and those people who are in the parishes. So that's been a great work and uh, very inspired by Mother Angelica years back. To, media missionaries? Yeah, media missionaries, yeah. It started off even before media missionaries when yeah. I took the job, you know, yeah. those people in the parish. But now it's a more organized type of program to get yeah. people more involved with what we're doing at yeah, when, EWTN. When I think about the Holy Fathers, both <clears throat> blessed John Paul as well as Benedict, uh, calling again for the new evangelization, mm -hmm. that really a person telling someone about EWTN is a part of the new evangelization. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, we're on virtually everywhere. Now it's get yeah. the word out. And, you know, that is a form of evangelization, like you said, Marcus, is having these people in the pews, in the parishes, tell, hey, watch Catholic television. You yeah. might learn something. You might draw you into a deeper spirituality. And I think that's working. Yeah, yeah. And then you ended up on Catholic radio. I did. You know, I have a sports background, which we'll, we'll talk about later, sure. but the show is called Blessed to Play. And I interview Catholic athletes. And what I do, like, we talk about their careers the first half of the show, and then we talk about their journeys in some, time, in yeah. some instances, but also their lives as Catholics. And, uh, you know, they give witness to who they are, and they give hope to the people listening who like sports especially. Yeah, because sports so often is the emphasis on the individual, the individual accomplishment, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, get there. And uh, the temptation is always there to be so individualistic and self-centered, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're successful. And yeah. then pretty soon there's the, the temptation to, to the whole world revol revolves around yourself. Mm -hmm. And so the, the faith can cut through that and make, and make sense and, and, and real meaning for athletes. Sure, and they know who to attribute their gifts to, and that yep. is to God himself. That, Once you recognize that, it purifies your talents, and you're able to perform better and be a better Christian. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's, with that as a background, I'm going to kick you way back, uh, drop kick you wow. the, <laughs> way back into your life and uh, let us know where you came from spiritually as a young man. I'm going to start out from the very beginning, the genesis of my life. <laughs> I was born in Misericordia Hospital in Bronx, New York. Now, if, I'm sure you know what Misericordia means. It's the Latin meaning is, uh, the English meaning, I should say, is mercy. So right. I came into a building that was promoting God's greatest attribute. So I was off to a good start. Yeah. So this was in the Bronx, New York, and I was baptized our Lady of Mount Carmel Parish in Bronx, New York. It was a very ethnic Italian neighborhood. So you're from the Bronx? I was born in the Bronx, I, yes. Okay. And this I church I was that. baptized in, <clears throat> you're, you had a previous guest who probably sat in this very chair who was baptized in the same church. His name was Dion DiMucci. <laughs> Wanderer, runaround yeah. Sioux. Right. Yo, right. Dion, yeah. So it was a very, uh, like I said, ethnic neighborhood. Um, very Catholic in the sense that uh, Italians are Catholic. So this is my upbringing for seven years. Um, the first seven years of my life, my parents divorced, and circumstances warranted that my father would raise me. Um, so 
you know, he raised me. I, I went to actually Catholic grammar school. I made my uh, first Eucharist. Um, but I would say my family life, I, I'm always hesitant to use the word cultural Catholic because there's such a beauty in the culture of Catholicism. Right, right. Uh, but the precursor is you have to have a relationship with Christ and his church. Yeah. I would say we were removed Catholics. Um, that's the best way I could describe it is that I made the sacraments, but in the daily life of, of family life, there was no talk about, you know, our faith. Uh, we didn't pray. We didn't even pray at meals. Yeah. So, um, as a kid growing up, you kind of don't have this a sense of faith is important. You know, the things of everyday life become more important to you. My father was a great athlete. Um, he introduced me to sports. I'm very thankful for that. So I got started young playing sports, and that kind of was like what I enjoyed as yeah. a kid. Even though I went to I went to Catholic school. I, I played sports in grammar school, so on and so forth. So that was really the start of uh, mm -hmm. getting kick off of who I was as a person. Um, so when you were thinking about what am I going to do with my life or you know, why am I going to all these things, the, the, a part of your thinking was, I wonder what God wants me to do. I never thought about it. Yeah. I never thought about it, even as a young boy. Um, we eventually, my father moved up in a company, we moved out to the Burbs, out of the Bronx when I was like eight years old to Westchester, New York. <laughs> um, so that type of living, he went through another divorce. So I didn't have that stability as a child. Uh, yeah. And the faith still wasn't introduced to me. Now, with that said, I remember when I made my first penance, my first communion, going to church, and I, there was something special about it. Hmm. Um, and I, you know, I couldn't put my hands on it, but I felt at home there. Um, in fact, I went to a basketball camp when I was, uh, I think, 11 years old. It was at Salesian High School in New Rochelle, so, New York. Right. And it was a two-week camp, and every day we had Mass. Every day. And I remember asking the priest, oh, I'd like, love to be an altar boy. Show me what it's like. And he showed me. And I remember there was just a special feeling there. Yeah. But after the, the uh, camp ended, you know, I returned to my normal life. We didn't go to church. So I just went on with my normal existence, playing sports. Was that school. special feeling, um, <clears throat> which I, I can imagine is maybe more of a Catholic experience than, let's say, a Baptist or a Presbyterian in the sense that, it wasn't so much you were feeling closer to God, but you were feeling closer to your Catholicism. You know what I mean? That that altar boy, that experience, connecting to the nostalgia of the of the experience of the church, mm -hmm. but not necessarily drawing your attention at that point to God. Would would that be an explanation of it? Or do you think you were getting dr dr drawn to? I God? I think I was getting point? drawn to God, but I didn't know it. Okay, because the right. Eucharist was there. I mean, yeah, we're in right, a church, okay. right? The tabernacle's there, so there's grace in that church. So you were experiencing something, you just couldn't put your finger on what and I was it, too was. Young, it was. Yeah, I was yeah, too young yeah. to really pinpoint it, okay? But okay. I knew that it was a good place to be. And, okay. I, and it, was, it was, you know, people were kind to one another, the priest was a good priest, so it was something good, you know? And, and I could come back to that as an adult sure. and have a good memory of that. So, you know, basically I did that. I, we moved out to New Jersey, and I started my formative years in high school. And like I said, we went through a lot of instability, family changes, so on and so forth. But the thing that really kept me grounded as a human being was sports. I mean, I, I found an identity in that. Uh, a sort of my friends became my surrogate family, so to speak. But at that point, I would never really think about God or think about objective truth at that point in my life. Um, I was just kind of going with the flow and the tide of, of society and what, what norms were at that time. But I think sports kept me out of a lot of things that I could have got into that would have really got me off on the wayward path. So I went to high school, played sports, and uh, I, I wound up going to a junior college in Rochester, New York. My dad got transferred to the corporate headquarters. He worked for Eastman Kodak at sure. the time. Yeah. And I wound up going to a junior college that had a baseball program that was ranked in the country. And the coach was a former drill sergeant in the Marines. <laughs> <laughs> and I made the team, and he instilled in me a, a very strong work, work ethic and uh, kind of a boot camp environment, which was good for me at the time. Um, I think as a kid at that time, Marcus, I was really searching. Um, I didn't have, I didn't know objective truth. I was uh, just kind of hanging out with friends, and, you know, I wasn't a bad person per se, but I didn't have any sense of identity who I was as a child of God at that time. Mm -hmm. After that, I went to go play semi-pro baseball. Wow. And I played for a year, did great. The second year I came back, I noticed something was wrong with my eyes. I would, uh, when I would go back for a, a foul pop or, a, or just a, a pop fly, my vision would juggle. And this is the reason why I'm telling you this story. Yeah. 
when I would turn my head real quickly when I was batting, my vision would juggle. Interesting. Wow. And my, I had a precipitous decline in my batting average. The coach asked me questions, you know, what's going on? Go see an eye doctor. Went to go see an eye doctor. He said, you're fine. Your vision's fine. So the coach said, it must be in your head. I said, okay, I believe that. Gave up baseball. I went down to Florida, and I lived in a condo. Uh, I had a relative who had a condo down there. Uh, lived on the, on the beach. Nice existence there. It was a bellman in a hotel. And I became friendly with a gentleman who was there at the hotel for two weeks. Uh, there was a motion picture that was going to be shot in a neighboring city when I was in Florida. We became friendly. He said, um, why don't you, uh, I think you have some ability here. Why don't you go and talk to the casting director? I'll set you up. Went to talk to the casting director, did a few lines, so on and so forth. He said, I think we have a part for you. It was a major motion, motion picture. He said, in two weeks, I want you to come down for the shoot. I said, okay, this is great, you know? <laughs> life, is, life is grand, living on the beach, about to shoot my first picture. Those two weeks, something happened that really changed my life, and God used it to draw me back to him. I was, went back to my bell, bellman position at the, the uh, hotel, and uh, one of my colleagues recognized that one of my eyelids was drooping. And, and I, didn't, I didn't notice. I said, okay. So I wanted to confirm this anomaly, so I went over to the mirror, and I, you know, my eyelids like this. So I said, oh, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah. You know, maybe need a few eye drops or something like that, and hocus pocus, it'll be gone, you know. So the next day, I woke up in the morning, the eyelid was still drooping. So my natural inclination was to go see an eye doctor. Um, so I went to an eye doctor in Florida, and he gave me a checkup, uh, ran some tests, and he said, this is not an eye problem. I said, what? It's not an eye problem. I go, my eyelid's drooping. It's an eye problem. He goes, no, it's not an eye problem. Hmm. He goes, you have to go see a neurologist. I said, a neurologist is a brain guy. I remember my exact words. He said, yes, you've got to go see a neurologist. So I, I called my father. I said, um, the eye doctor says I need to see a, a neurologist. And this is like a week out from the shoot. Okay, so I have to fly back to Rochester, New York. I think I'm just going to get a, some medicine or something. It's going to be taken care of. I'll be good to go. And the neurologist, they, I went to Strong Memorial Hospital in Rochester, New York, and they uh, ran a series of tests. Hmm. And it confirmed that I had myasthenia gravis, which is grave weakness in the vernacular. It's one of the 40 muscular dystrophy diseases. Oh, wow. And the doctor told me I was, you know, 19, 20 years old here. He said, well, I'm going to be honest with you. It's most likely going to go into your arms. You're going to have severe weakness into your leg muscles. It could affect your breathing and you could succumb to it. <laughs> My world was rocked. <laughs> My world was rocked. <laughs> My plans in Florida pushed aside, could not do that. I remember laying in bed, I was kind of depressed and just waiting for the disease to progress throughout my whole body. And sure enough, uh, within a couple of weeks, it went to my other eye. And it got to the point where I had double vision. I couldn't open my eyelids. And I couldn't play sports. I hardly could drive. And I fell into really a depression. I just, you know, you know what hope is there? Because it sounded like the doctor didn't give you uh, any kind of treatment for it? Well, they did. They put me on a medicine that wasn't working. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, they, so they thought they had something, but no. They did. Yeah, I mean, they gave me some therapy, but the therapy wasn't uh, working at the time. Um, so I was laying there uh, depressed, and I just you didn't know what I was going to do with my life, and I wasn't happy camper. I decided to make a trip to the church, the local Catholic church, in Webster, New York, most holy Trinity Catholic church. <laughs> now, mind you, I didn't go there because I was seeking God. I wanted a peaceful refuge. I just wanted a place where it was quiet, where I could play, pray, and just think about things in a different was environment. Because you're different. remembering that, was it connected with that experience you had earlier then? Uh, there was something? No, I didn't connect just, it. I just, you know, I knew I was Catholic. I was brought up in a, I, yeah, yeah, there was yeah. a Catholic church. I was familiar with Catholic yeah. churches. Yeah, okay. And I knew that was my experience. So mm -hmm. maybe that did play a part. But um, I just wanted to go to that church and just think. Well, I, walked, I went to this church on a Sunday. I didn't think the churches were open on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. So I went on Sunday, and just so happens to be the start of Mass. So I went in. I said, oh, no, there's all these people here. I wanted to go be in the church by myself. So I, I go in. I sit in the back. And I remember uh, taking a seat ma uh, during Mass. There was these two guys who looked like veterans. They were in World War II or, you know, whatever. And they were at the doors guarding it. And I had this thought that if I got up and tried to leave the church during Mass, they were going to pick me up by the, by the shirt or whatever I was wearing and say, get back in that pew. 
the mess is not over. <laughs> so this is the thoughts going through my mind. So I'm here at Mass. I, I didn't know what I was doing, the progressions, the kneels, the stands, the sits. You know, I was always late. You know, it was kind of like I was really out of sync. <laughs> It came down to the consecration. And these terms I was I'm describing to you, but I was not familiar with these terms at the time. Yeah. So I'm just absorbing the liturgy. During the consecration, my eyelids are drooping now. During the consecration, my eyelids gain full strength. I mean, they just go boom. Yeah. And I got a warmth over me. I, I just felt totally different. And I didn't know what was going on. I just couldn't put words to it. But I felt God's love in such an immeasurable and powerful way. It, you know, it was a moment of faith for me. And I couldn't even describe it. Yeah. When I left the church, my eyelids went back down. Everything returned back to its, its state it was before I entered the church. Went home to Dad, told him the story. said, oh, the medication must be working. And I said, yeah, I, I'll buy that. So I said, well, i got to test it out again. So... I didn't realize there was a daily Mass, so I didn't go on Monday. I thought I had to wait till next Sunday to go back to Mass. <laughs> I went back to Mass the next Sunday and... Uh, All week the same experience in terms between you know, the drooping eyes. Drooping and, eyes, yeah. back to that state. Medication wasn't working, except it was giving me pains in the stomach and all this other stuff. Oh, yeah. Went back to church the second Sunday and the same thing happened. I knew there was a God. <laughs> I knew there was a God. And I said... You have a plan for my life. I knew there was objective truth, not intellectually. I just had, it was. I came to faith on that day. You know, I didn't have an intellectual understanding of my faith at the time. And God, I knew God loved me, and I knew that there was a purpose for my life. And the depression, just even though I was battling this condition, I knew that everything was going to be all right because God was real. There's something that transcends everyday life and the falsities that I was thinking were going to motivate me to lead a good life or even the life that I thought was good, which necessarily wouldn't be good for myself. <laughs> so I, uh, it was the start of my journey right here. You know, I uh, went to Arizona, I left Rochester, New York. I got involved with a parish out in Arizona, I had a strong youth group, uh, young people who were athletic, who uh, loved their faith. I mean, it was such a beautiful time because I was able to be with my peers and to talk about faith. And, and I prayed so much. I just, I just wanted to be close to Jesus all the time. Now, what was happening with your condition? Well, the condition uh, at that time when I first went to Arizona uh, was still the same. Yeah, it was a struggle right. for two years. But then I, uh, I was put on another medication. And I was, they told me that only 10% of myasthenics, the disease, it will be in your eyes. I mean, yeah. you know, 90% of it goes to your limbs. I was one of those 10% that remained in the eyes, which was a blessing. I was put on a medication that actually worked miracles for me. Yeah. Um, my eyes gained, you know, I, I was less symptomatic, although I had moments. I was able to pursue my athletic inclinations. I was able to relatively lead a normal yeah. life. But, but it's also powerful, and maybe we can talk about this later too, is that the, the message that our Lord was giving you at that time is, is key because sometimes people think, well, you know, you weren't healed, so. Mm -hmm. But the point was, no, he was getting the message across to you in the midst of that, regardless of whether you were healed or not. Right. You know, his love for you, it isn't always a, uh, a direct connect. If you have faith, you'll be, right. you'll be healed. Right. No, no, no. He's real in the midst of whatever suffering you're called to do. So that was where he touched you in the midst of that. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I didn't care if, care if I was healed. I wanted to get better. I mean, don't get me wrong. But the most important thing now is I had a relationship yeah. with God. I remember going home, you know, and obviously I don't come from a Protestant faith, but I remember going home and putting on Protestant networks and just being inspired by the preaching. Yeah. I mean, they were talking about Jesus, okay? And I, and I love that. And then I'm flipping through the channels one day and I see this nun on the TV and I have it. <laughs> and you know, I'm not the type of guy at that time that was gonna stop for a nun, but she's talking truth. She's talking in a motherly way. She's being a little firm, but just she's being loving and she's telling me what I needed to hear on that specific day and time of my life. And that was Mother Angelica. Yeah. <laughs> so. And I would make sure I would come back to her every week. In fact, I remember friends calling me saying, hey, Ron, we're doing this tonight. Would you like to go with us? And I said, no, no, I, uh, I have to meet with someone. A, a friend's going to be over. Well, that friend was Mother Angelica, even though I didn't know her at the time. <laughs> but I just wanted to hear what she had to say. And I was growing in my faith immensely. Um, so you're serving the young people then out in Arizona, you said? You're, you're doing some youth work? And I was doing some youth work. I was being fed as I was doing that. I was doing everything. I was a co-worker for Mother uh, Teresa. I would go, uh, 
go pick at abortion clinics. I thought I had to do everything for God, you know? It was, it was a, a very uh, youthful enthusiasm, I would say. Somewhat immature, I would admit to that. You know, I used to call people and say, you know, God is real. I mean, you know, it's not just a statue. And they used to think I was bonkers, you know? But, you know, there was this enthusiasm that was in me, and uh, I think God honored that. It was, it was a purity of spirit and uh, of enthusiasm as well. But it also points to the reality of that change. It really that, does. That authentic change of heart, uh, conversion of heart that... Uh, that reached into your depression to touch you on that. That in the end, I, you know, I've often, w when people watch the program and often say, I wish I had that kind of conversion. Uh, and the truth is, it's, it's not something we make happen. Mm -hmm. It's something that is, is a gift. It's something we appreciate. And then the truth is that if a person is saying, I wish I had that, the truth is you're having it. Yeah. The, the fact that you want to get closer to God is evidence of the change of heart of grace. Sure. Otherwise, you wouldn't want that. But you want that, well, then you're having it and say, thank you, Lord. I mean, that's what our response always is to be. Yes, and it doesn't have to be dramatic. I mean, my situation is my situation, you know. And others, it's going to be obviously different as, as the guests, many guests you've interviewed on this program. Well, even as you said, when you left that church the second time, you went back, your eyes are drooping again, it was back. To, but the fact is you knew mm -hmm. here. I did. And the reality of God. I did, yeah, I really did. Was your dad happy about this? Uh, you know, we had our battles, let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> I can't say my family was on board, so to speak. Um, you know, I remember having a lot of conversations and really starting to get to know my faith. And I think there was a, uh, how do I say it? There was a uh, different viewpoint on the Catholic faith and what I was going through. And uh, you know what? I found out in life as I mature that, you know, you don't come to faith so people agree with you, right? I mean, right. that's not the important part, right. or even to convert people. I mean, that's a work of yeah. grace. Yeah, it's sometimes work of in, those, in those enthusiastic young days, you're trying to convert everybody, and you're yeah. making more of a pain uh, than you are as a helpful. I mean, God bless us, you know, when we when we're have that enthusiasm. We're planting seeds, but mm. you know, sometimes our family doesn't know what to do with us during those, those times. But. No, but I think they've seen a maturation yeah. process where, as I've grown up, they know that I'm not bonkers, so to speak. You know, that it's, the faith should be very natural to us. You know, it should be part of who we are. But getting back to my time in Arizona, um, it, it was a time of growth in the faith. And uh, I was led after Arizona, I decided to go to Franciscan University. Um, but let, let me back up to Arizona. Yep. Yep. I met, and this is an interesting story, I met a, I had a friend when I was going to finishing up my associate's degree at a junior college in Arizona. He was Protestant, and actually his father is one of the principal organizers of the Campus Crusade for Christ, Bill Bright. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we used to get in, we had a wonderful friendship. We used to get in a lot of discussions about Christ. But he brought me to his, uh, his house one day, and he introduced me as a born-again Catholic. Born-again Catholic. And I was kind of puzzled by that. I didn't know the terminology. I, didn't, I, I just wasn't, uh, had a, a distinct understanding of my faith at the time. So after we left the, uh, the house, I said, uh, what is a born-again Catholic? He goes, well, you, you believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I go, well, yeah, yeah. Jesus is your personal savior. I go, oh well, yeah, that's true. He goes, well, you're a born again Catholic. I go, okay. So I went back to my Catholic friends. I said, uh, did you know that we're born again Catholics? And my, one of my friends said, what are you talking about born again? Born again is Protestantism, it's not Catholic. And I said, really? I said, he said, if you, you know, we believe that you know, Jesus is a personal savior, relationship with Christ, and we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, so we're born again Catholics. So I said, I had to get to the bottom of this. So I went to a priest. And for the first time, he told me, you were born again at baptism. You were born again of water and spirit. You became a new creation in Christ at that time. He said, oh. And I realized for the first time that I have to start studying my faith. Hmm. I don't know it. I don't hmm. know it. So I systematically went into different issues that came up. Purgatory was a, a difficult concept for me, to be quite honest with yeah. you. And here's what I thought about it. I said, I love Christ with all my heart right now. How could he not accept me into heaven? And then I had to be uh, uh, taught what token responsibility is, you know, hmm. that, you know, I could throw the ball through the window and I could go up to the person and say, hey, I'm sorry, I broke your window, but the right course of action would be to pay for that window as well. So I knew that it came to me years later that, you know, I don't want to go into heaven if I'm not perfect because heaven is perfect to be with God. And it really is a different understanding of sin coming myself from a Protestant background where instead of sin 
merely being only, there's a rule you shouldn't do it, and then you did it. Mm -hmm. And so you say, I'm sorry I did it, and so you move on. But that sin has an effect on us. Yes. It affects us as a person, yes. and it has a, 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 a taint. Yes. Um, and that's what has to be cleansed uh, mm -hmm. if we were to stand before God without embarrassment. So. Yes, absolutely. And I knew that uh, the sacrament of confession became all the more powerful because of that. Um, you know, I frequent that a lot, and I needed it as a young man. And I try to live a life really pleasing to God after this conversion happened. Going to Franciscan University, I was able to grow my faith even more. Now that's a big jump from Arizona to Franciscan. I mean, what got you that big jump? Well, I'll tell you, I was, uh, <laughs> I was picketing an abortion clinic, and I met a student who went to Franciscan. And he told me about the school at the time and that they were uh, dynamically Catholic, they were faithful to the teachings of the church, vibrant student body and with, with the faith life. Uh, this is a little commercial for the university. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to pay anything, though. But um, so I, I knew it was the right place. You know, I, I could have went to other places, maybe. Um, but for me at that time, I think to grow spiritually even superseded maybe pursuing some different academic endeavors that I wanted to do at that time. And I went to Franciscan, and it was a blessing. I got to go to Austria, yeah. um, study, got to know what the church is universally by going to these different churches in, in Europe and, and seeing the beauty of the church. I'm trying to remember what it was when you, you and I first met. I can't remember what the we occasion met was. before pre-EWTN, before well, both of, course, of us. Right, yeah, I was living at a house with Paul Key. Oh, there we go. This, there we go, yeah. Who sat he's in this a, chair. He's a, he's a priest now, right? Yes. He's got dispensation. Yep, yep, yep. And I remember you coming over. I think you were studying at Duquesne. I remember listening to you and Paul talk, and I was like a fly on the wall. I was like, wow, I was just learning. He was also a, a former Presbyterian pastor. He was. That, that came in the year before I, and he was my, Marilyn and my sponsor into the church when we came. So we were. Oh, is that right? Okay. We were always talking about the issues of the journey. Yeah, absolutely. So there you were. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I used to listen to you guys. I remember I was learning so much at the time. And you know, I would take classes at the university from Scott Hahn and some other professors as well, and really come to a deeper understanding of what it means to be Catholic. And, and I took the faith not, you know, when I was taking these courses, it wasn't only just an intellectual understanding of the faith, but I was trying to make it part of my heart. that It's, all, it's a prayer to understand this faith, what the yeah. church is teaching. So I think I grew intellectually uh, in that, and it helped me out a great deal. I'm thinking maybe it's time to take a break because we're at, you're at Franciscan and still, because I want to talk more about, as we go back to your, your idea that these were not accidental awakenings, but mm -hmm. they were really the work of God's merciful grace touching you, even when you were not looking for Him at all. Yeah, There He was all along. So we'll talk about it when we get back. See you in a bit. to the journey home. I'm your host Marcus Grodi. We're joined this evening with Ron Meyer who uh, uh, works for EWTN uh, both uh, on staff in the, uh, the marketing department uh, as well as a radio program. So that's, that, right. that's pretty neat. We stopped with your story at Franciscan and, and you and I were there at the same time yeah. uh, really essentially <laughs> but I want to make sure you know is your illness is it still following you along as you continue in the journey at this point? It is, yeah. I'm, I'm on a medicine that has helped me out a great deal. I was able, uh, post my diagnosis, to return to sports, and um, I was able to play baseball at Franciscan University. Then I, I took up the sport of racquetball. So I, I've been competing at a high amateur level. I played in a couple lower-level pro tournaments as well. So God has really blessed me and kept my athletic talent, but, you know, I'm playing for Him now. I enjoy it. I'm the type of guy who I like to give my all, so sports is kind of a natural inclination for me and always has been. And I've met some great people through the world of sports, uh, you know, great Catholics, great Christians. So it's been a, a wonderful blessing through everything, even having this condition, to be able to play. I, I, that's how I came up with the name of the show, Blessed to Play. If I must digress a little bit, <laughs> I was trying to think about what could I name this show. And I thought about my own life, and I, I, the word that came to mind initially was graced. To play, but it didn't sound right, you know, grace to play. But it is grace. I mean, yeah, uh, the, right. the fact that I could get up and, and move and to play sports is a blessing from God. So, and I think for all athletes, so I came up with the name Blessed to Play. 
well, the mystery of how God works in our life, would you say, looking back, if it hadn't been for the illness, might you not have been open to the work of God in your life? You know, Marcus, I don't know how it would have happened. You know, I, I, you know who's, who's to say? It's a hypothetical. Right. Um, you know, my normal course of going on with everyday life, I don't think I would have wound up where I am today. Let's put it that way. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, God reached out to me. I don't know why he did. You know, yeah. I can't answer that question. I know he loves us all, but why did he reach out to me? Yeah. Um, Which to me is a message of evangelization because we never know the people in our life mm -hmm. who maybe have left the church and are out there. They, they may see seemingly unreachable. Yeah. I wonder if the people who knew you would have, seen, would have thought you were seemingly unreachable. <laughs> maybe. But you never know when God might allow whatever it is. So our evangelization is to surround them with the love and the truth so that when they go through the crisis, mm -hmm. they grab the right thing. Absolutely. You could have grabbed, instead of going to that church, you could have gone to a bar. You, I could have. I think it would have come to a point, going through the depression and going, having this illness, I would have turned to something else. I don't know what I would have turned to. I wasn't contemplating anything at the time. But going back to your original yeah. point, I've had friends call me who knew me uh, pre-conversion, if you will, you know, mm -hmm. and they've told me on the phone, you've changed. <laughs> but it wasn't like, we're happy you changed, you know, <laughs> but you've changed. And I said, yes, I have changed, you know. and. Um, you know, there's some things you've got to remove uh, from your life. I had to distance myself from certain relationships in order so I could grow yeah. in my uh, relationship with God, you know, and do diff things a lot differently. I, so many good people were brought into my life, yeah. I mean, along this journey. Um, really, some loving people, great priests. I mean, I want to just give a plug for the priesthood right here. There are just incredible priests out there. Um, I know being on the campus of Franciscan University, yeah. having relationships with a lot of the priests there, I mean, it was just a, a yeah. great blessing. Yeah. So it's such a positive influence on my life, and I, I think our audience needs to hear that. You know. Your experience at EW, at uh, Franciscan, did it set a trajectory for your life and what you wanted to do? Were you hearing God in that? Or? Yeah, you know what, I, you know, I think it came down to the point, I want to do God's will in my life, whatever that may be. I love communications. I love, I love the creativity. Uh, you know, I love acting. I love stuff like that. I was a communications major at okay. Franciscan. Um, so I worked on uh, a number of shows there that we did. I actually had a program on campus called Profile. My second guest was this guy named Marcus Grodi. And you probably don't even remember this. I don't. It was in the bottom. It, it was in the bottom of one of the uh, buildings there at Franciscan, and you were telling your journey into the Catholic faith. And I remember this distinctly. I have it on cassette tape. I don't have a cassette player now. I can't play it. So, <laughs> but you were gracious enough to come down as a student. I, uh, I did an interview with you. That's so I wild. That. Yeah. I guess that just shows you when. When you get up my age, you start forgetting things. I guess I don't remember <laughs> that. Well, that's great. That's so anyway, I'm sure it didn't leave an indelible mark on you. But anyway, it was just, it was my I was getting I was green. I was getting my feet wet. But the point being is that I really love communications, and that really you know brought me into the job with EWTN. I, you know, one of the theses I did was on this, the 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 uh, encyclical on the social means of communications in the church, and I and I just saw that we could use this for so much good hmm. to get the word out to uh, bring people in deeper relationship with Christ and His church. So uh, I was really enthused when I came on board with EW10 and continued that mission that was uh, very influential on my heart. All right. Now, did you uh, uh, married? Did it happen while you were at Franciscan? Or? I didn't. <laughs> and, you know, I thought that, you know, if I didn't get married at Franciscan, I must have a vocation. I was wondering if you were discerning that. I was uh, always discerning. You know, yeah. I, I couldn't figure out what God wanted me to do. <laughs> you know, and I spent many hours in prayer trying to figure that out. And it's always a, a tug of war, so to speak. Um, you know what? I was open to it. I was open to the priesthood, you know. I, but I wanted to do God's will, His perfect will. Um, I wound up uh, working for a pro-life organization out back in Arizona, and I would go around speaking on Jesus' the divine mercy as well. I did it at prison, sometimes conferences. Mm -hmm. But I met my future wife back in Arizona. She was working for this pro-life organization. You know, started off as friends, one thing led to another, and we, we got married. So um, it's interesting how that, that came to be. All right. Got an email that touches on the sports issue, uh, Joseph from Newark. What sort of approach should Catholics take towards sports? It seems like some people hold them up as a god, mm -hmm. but then again, there are positive aspects to appreciate about sports as well. How can we strike the right balance? 
Well, that's the key. We need to strike the right balance. You know, even with the show, sports is not supposed to be the be-all, end-all, okay? Um, you have to have your priority right with Christ first, okay? One thing that sports does, though, uh, if you're a competitive athlete, is that you, you have to give your best. Um, John Paul II was a great athlete. Blessed Pope John Paul II. He always told us to give our best in no matter what we do. Be not afraid. You know, go out there. Um, give it your all. And he, he gave countless talks to different sports organizations, yeah. admonitions telling them to do this. So we need to really give our best. And there's a parallel between sports and the spiritual life. Because if we're going to give our best in sports, we also need to give our best in the spiritual life. So um, there is a balance. I don't like the term idol being used out there in the media. This sports are as an idol yeah. because it takes the place of God an idol. You don't want them to be an idol. Right. So we, we could look up to people for their talents and see how they go about their daily business and maybe take something away from that. But um, I think sports could really uh, enliven virtue in us. It could develop virtue in us and build a lot of character. Yeah, again, the media doesn't understand when a Catholic says, my number one goal is to become a saint. The media doesn't understand that. They, they think, oh, you're trying to be, have your name in a book somewhere yeah. or have a statue. You know, that's completely it. It's also when Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what a sports star should be saying mm -hmm. because he, he, re, he needs to recognize whether he wants it to be there or not, he is a public figure. Right. And so now he needs to tell his young people, you imitate me as I imitate Christ. Right. That's not an arrogant thing. That's a humiliating, humble. Right acceptance of responsibility. Right. And I thought about a neat thing for your show. Yeah. I'm always open to new ideas. Well, no, do you remember the episode from the great movie about Newt Rockney? You remember that great movie? I do, I do, yeah. There's a scene in there when Newt Rockney is invited to come to New York because there are a bunch of intellectuals that are trying to stop college athletics. Mm -hmm. And so Newt Rockney was invited to, to come to defend why there should be athletics at college. And it's a neat s sequence to, mm -hmm. to, to listen to his argument. And one of his arguments are that, young, that men are going to be competitive. Right. That's a part of our nature. Uh -huh. If we don't have sports, you end up with the battles and wars that you have in Europe. Yeah. But the, the, you know, the competition, the control, the order, the teamwork uh, takes this natural competitiveness and turns it in a good direction. Absolutely. Changing character. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you, you mentioned the word there, team, the team aspect of it. What team sports helps you to do is you've got to really die to yourself. It's not all about you. I mean, you're, you're, you're with these teammates. You've got to do things for them. You've got to play on their behalf. So it's not all about you. It's not only focused on you. And I think, you know, just the physical nature of sports, as far as the spiritual life, there's been studies done the more you, when you... Uh, when you exert yourself, you're able to pray better. You have to have a clear mind. So there's a natural benefit in your uh, physiology from sports that can help you even pray better, draw closer to Christ. Yeah, actually, that's one of the reasons I particularly like football, because really as a team sport, so many other sports like soccer or even basketball, which I love, um, the individual can be a real, you know, showtime yeah. you know, in, in that, yet winning it for the team, yet in football. Yeah, that that tackle absolutely is just as important as a quarterback. Yeah, though you may never know his name. Right, but if he doesn't do his job, that quarterback's going to get creamed back there. That's right. That's the beauty of everybody knowing their vocation. Mm -hmm. The church, everyone is important in the church. Yeah, from absolutely. the pope down to the lowly you and me. Right. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Another email, Nathan from Bellevue. Uh, in what ways can I prepare my sons? to be real men and strong witnesses of true masculinity? Hmm, that's a good question. What is true masculinity? Okay. Well, society tells you a number of things that are true masculinity that are actually false masculinity. Okay. <laughs> um, I think for males, work on purity. Okay. I think we're getting bombarded, not only in the secular media, but just in society with impure messages that is drawing males away from living a pure life. And we got to take the... Um, how do I say, we, we have to t put the focus on Christ, yes, but we also have to take steps in our own life to remain pure. And that means what we watch, right? Uh, what we get involved in, okay? And we have to really protect that because there's an assault on purity for males out there. And if you're gonna yeah. be uh, an authentic male with 
authentic masculinity, you know, look to what Christ was. I mean, who was he? He was a defender, right? He defended, I'm sure he defended his family. Um, he was out there in the battle lines standing up for truth. That's what we're called to be as men. We're called to stand for truth, okay? And we're called to defend our family and also our faith as well. So I, I think that, that's what we need to work on as males. Yeah, I, I recently turned the big 6-0 in my life and I was thinking, okay, what have I learned in these years? You know, what, what have I learned? And I wrote in my journal, maybe the one thing I've learned is that the measure to which we have grown in humility mm -hmm. is the, me the measure to which we have grown at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, really that's it, this yeah. issue of humility. And how do we help our young men grow in true masculinity? They mm -hmm. need to understand humility. Mm -hmm. It really and that helps in the way we love, the way we treat other people, the way we understand ourselves and God's call, our gifts. If there isn't a seed of humility, there's always the danger of idolatry Absolutely. based on ourself. Email from John. How do we seal the deal with our young people? Are there any resources I can turn to? I am sponsoring a second cousin for confirmation, but his family situation is anything but Catholic or even Christian. It's all relative in their, everything's relative in their philosophy. Mm -hmm. So how can I seal the deal for a young person? That's their wonder. Well, I think it really depends on the person itself. You know, I, I, I think you have to treat each person uniquely, okay? Um, you know, you gotta build a friendship with people. You really do. You gotta learn how, to show them that you, you really genuinely care for them. You can't bombard them over the he head with every book that's out there. I mean, I think things gotta be introduced in a very uh, a normal way. Um, I think it has to be done in a way that's not threatening to them. But yet you could speak truth and build a relationship with a person, especially with young people. I mean, young people could sense if you're real or not. I remember working in youth ministry, being a youth coordinator out in Arizona, which we skipped over in Lake Havasu City. I was a, a youth coordinator for a year and a half and I worked with young people. You know what, I didn't do a lot of preaching per se. I mean, I would pray with them, I would talk about the faith, but I think my most gains came that one-on-one -on -one time. Yeah. When we didn't talk even about matters of faith, I, what's going on in your life with your family, so on and so forth, being an ear to them. Once they trust you, you could tell them, hey, what's, why are you reaching out to me? What's going on in your life? They want to know. So I would say be a friend, but also be open to talking about your faith as well, to draw them closer to God. Yeah, I mean, here we are in an election year, and often the big battles are, you know, whether our government should sh set standards for our culture. Yeah. And the point is, Regardless of what the government sets as a standard, we as individuals need to live our faith and help our young people know what's true, regardless mm -hmm. of where the government is. Oh, absolutely. And that's really the key. And, and like you said, it's those relationships that are going to make these young men think, well, maybe there's another way compared to where our culture is going. Or, right. And they yearn for that, Marcus. You yeah. know that. They yearn for that because yeah. the culture is not telling them what truth is. And it, it's, it's, it's not a slippery slope. I mean, I think the, the avalanche is happening as we speak. Well, well let me ask you that because there's a, been a, a, such a change in our ability to minister to young people over the years because of the battles. Mm -hmm. I remember 40 years ago when I did youth ministry, I could hang around with kids. Well, now it's changed. Oh, yeah. The devil's really changed the world. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, on the other hand, the increased ability from the media has given another tool to reach those young people. Absolutely, yeah. You could reach them, what now, on their, their iPad, right? Through their earbuds, yeah. on TV, radio. So we use these uh, communications mediums to reach young people as well, to draw them closer to Christ. It's a very great tool. And I, your radio program with sports is one that might awaken them to the issues that are so important to them, sports. And so, yeah. I, I mean, that's great, that's great. Another email, Patrick from Massachusetts, when you speak, with a non-believer, how do you get him or her to believe in Christianity? I have gone to Mass all my life, and I have recently been having a much more difficult time believing, as I have never seen or known anyone who has been healed or seen a miracle or any of the other things that convinced the disciples. I've never seen any of the things that are written about in the New Testament. Even after Jesus supposedly ascended, the apostles experienced the Holy Spirit in a really dramatic way and healed people themselves. How are we supposed to believe? Wow. I think these same miracles are going on today, by the way. I mean, everyone poo poos. <laughs> well, that's that. your point of your own experience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but everyone poo poos <laughs> that there's no miracles going on anymore. There's miracles going on every day. Yeah. And maybe the secular media doesn't put it on their headlines, but there's a lot of miracles, God's grace reaching out in the most profound way to many individuals. 
and, and turning them back to faith. Um, so, you know, for non-believers, I mean, first of all, I take the position that we're not called to make people believe. That's a work of God's grace. We're called to just be instruments of who we are as Catholics, to the, defend truth, okay, be who we are, and hopefully someone will see something in us. Um, I don't think it's our, uh, how do I say it, it's our, uh, we're, we're not in, put in a position where we need to convert. We can't put the pressure on us, okay? It's a work of God's grace, okay? When it becomes more inward that I have to convert someone, I think it's more our doing rather than letting God do the work. But we need to be open to truth, drawing them closer to Christ, and hopefully God's grace could work in their lives. You, you know, your journey and mine are all the details, places, things were radically different, mm -hmm. except that one moment that you talked about was so like my own moment in the sense that something happened where in that moment you knew it was God. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. You weren't saying, what a coincidence, right. uh, ain't I lucky? Um, wasn't I so wise? Right. No, no. You knew the cutting through all that junk that it was God. That's the work. And, you know, how do we make someone believe? We can't, but maybe we, we should get people, at least encourage them, mm -hmm. to start expecting, mm -hmm. start looking for God in their life. Are you always giving yourself credit? Are you recognizing that's, are you called to be thankful? Yeah. This is God doing things in your life. No, absolutely, yeah. And I think God is always reaching out to the, His souls, His children, okay? Even if we're steeped in sin, He's always reaching out to us in some way. Are we going to hear His voice? Are we open to His voice? Are we going to accept His voice? But we've got to root out sin in our life. It clouds it up. Yeah, and sometimes it's just merely a simple prayer, Lord, 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 Lord help me. Mm -hmm. Speak to me. Show me something. And then anticipate really believe. And you go through difficult times, there's dark times, we know that. Yeah. But that's what I think also is a part of the message of your story. You didn't just walk out of there completely healed, no, no. but he awakened you to the reality of his presence and it changed your whole life to this day. You did, and one of the things he gave me was purpose for my life. I had a purpose for my life. Why do I exist? I think every human being has to come into this, this ontological question. Why do I exist? <laughs> Why am I here? Am I here to make a lot of money? Am I here to go through the muck of everyday life? Why am I here? Why did God create me? Well, it's pretty easy, right? The Baltimore Catechism tells us that, right? <laughs> to love and to serve Him. Yeah. Very good. Karen from Tulsa writes, I've had a number of serious work-related and personal setbacks in the past few months, and I am beginning to feel like I did something to make God angry, and so He is punishing me. Mm. Do you think that might be the case? Karen's her name? Yes. Yeah. Karen, God wants to draw you closer to Him. He is a merciful God, and He wants, you know, sometimes we hold our past against us, and God doesn't want us to hold our past against us. He wants us to turn to Him. If you're Catholic, go to the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Get right with Him. Get the grace to be stronger, and enter into the bosom of the Church. I mean, what better way than approaching Christ than to receive Him in the Eucharist, you know, body, soul, and divinity? Uh, talk about a personal relationship. It doesn't get any more personal than that. You know, we're actually, it's a physical presence too. We're actually taking God into us. Turn to the church, turn to Him. He's merciful and doesn't want to hold, hold you back from being in a relationship with Him. Yeah, I would encourage uh, Karen uh, to read Philippians chapter 4 and, and prayerfully think about it, about um, rejoicing, about um, in all things, giving thanks to God. Um, it, where he says, I have learned in all situations to be content. It wasn't that all of a sudden he was, he learned. Yeah. It was a process. Yes. Paul talks about all this stuff, uh, prayer and petition with thanksgiving, mm -hmm. and God will give you the peace. That's in Philippians 4. Pray Philippians 4, read it, maybe once a day for a month. Uh, and expect that God's going to touch you, even in the midst of like your own situation. Uh, are you still dealing with a little bit of that illness? Is that completely gone? You, you no, it's, it's not gone. Yeah, I've had battles with it, even though I've been on a med uh, medication. I've had double vision. Uh, you know, I, I have a funny story. You know, I'm a competitive racquetball player. <laughs> I'm playing in a tournament in Pittsburgh, and uh, 
I made it to the semifinals, and this guy I played, I beat quite frequently in other tournaments. In the middle of the second game, I started to have double vision. And now in racquetball, it's hard enough to hit one ball, yet alone two coming at you, you know? <laughs> so I just look terrible on the court now. I, I'm like trying to wink so I can reduce my <laughs> double vision. I, I'm not even hitting the ball. And the guy comes up to me, what are you doing? Why are you trying to throw this game? And I'm not going to go into the long explanation about my double vision. So I, I'm not a quitter. So I said, I'm going to stay on the court and do whatever I can to try to, you know, pull out a victory and do the best I could. But, you know, I do have my battles with double vision sometimes. And, uh, you know, Marcus, uh, it's not easy. It's, it's at times I want God to take it away fully, you know, in my humanity. But it's the best thing. It's the greatest blessing that's ever, ever happened to me. Without this condition, I don't think I come to Christ. I mean, maybe there was another way that I can't foresee or haven't, was not predictable. Yeah. But without this, I wouldn't be right here on the journey home with you today. Thorn in the flesh. It is. St. Paul's thorn in the flesh. Yeah, and I need a good beating every once in a while. <laughs> what have you learned from your interviews of sports figures? If you were to summarize with some of the key things, what have you, you learned? I think people look at sports figures and they make them superhuman because of their talent. I often say that our, our talents don't define who we are. They define what we do. Hmm. People have, when they look at a, a great athlete, they look at him for what he is as an athlete, not who he is as a person. What I'm trying to bring out in this show is that there's a faith life be, behind these great athletes, okay? And um, I think that makes them more human, more relatable to people. Um, I think in the secular media, secular media, they don't want you to look at them as such. They're kind of marketing tools, if you will, larger than life, um, to be applauded for their athletic ability. Then when they don't have it anymore, you can tear them down. Okay. Interesting, yeah. Um, you know, these guys, a lot of them come from really broken past. I mean, they're, you know, to think that you're a professional athlete, you make all this money, you get all this fame, that you're going to be totally fulfilled is a lie. I mean, a lot of the guys who come on my show are rock bottom, even though they had all this. Okay, they weren't being fulfilled because they didn't have their relationship right with yeah. Christ uh, in right order. If you don't have the key relationship with our Lord, you won't know how to win and you won't know how to lose. Absolutely. And you can't deal with the losing. Yeah, e either winning or losing. You, yeah. can't, you can't approach it correctly either way right. unless you're, your heart and mind are in the right place with our Lord. Another aspect to the show is that God has used sports as an instrument to uh, guide some of these athletes to vocations even. Yeah, I've interviewed a number of elite athletes who are now priests or religious sisters, Olympians and former pro athletes. And God used sports to draw them into the priesthood. It was part of their journey. So uh, there's a very enlightening and very joyful aspect to their journeys as athletes as well. Yeah, it's, it is interesting when you see any of these religious that were movie stars or, you know, or, or very successful military men or sports to see that in the midst of that, the Lord helped them discover this was showing their gifts, yeah. but how they could more effectively use them for the kingdom of God. Absolutely. And the power of that. Let's say you're talking to somebody out there right now that is now where you were. Yeah. Uh, what would you like to say to them to encourage them to make the same journey home you've made? Number one, wherever you are in your life, don't despair. I mean, you know, I, I think uh, when that scripture that says uh, the sin, number one sin is blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. You know, in my mind, I think it's despair when you mm -hmm. don't think God's mercy can cover your sins. Um, you've got to turn to God in a very simple way. I mean, just say, God, you know, I don't understand everything. I didn't understand everything, that's for sure. <laughs> but I am open to you and to your truth and relationship with you. You're not going to find happiness pursuing everything in this world. You might have moments of happiness, but it's not going to be sustained over a period of time. When you come to a relationship with Christ in His church, you have joy. It doesn't take all the pain away, but you have a reason, a purpose for your life, and you grow in relationship with God. There's nothing better than that. Another thing from your story kind of sticks out in my mind is, is that evangelism in many ways isn't just bringing someone to our Lord, it's bringing, him, bringing our friends to the body, mm -hmm. to the church. Yeah. I mean, that's where He touched you. You came to the church in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament, in the midst of the Mass. So part of our evangelization is inviting people to come home. That's true. Bringing them with us, you know, and through our relationships, as you said. It's really the relationship with the young people that you were doing. 
Well, Ron, thanks for joining Marcus, us. Marcus, I enjoyed it home. immensely. Thank you yeah. very much for your work with EWTN as well as your radio program and your witness. So God bless you, my friend. Thank you. It's good to have you on the program, even though I'm sorry I don't remember that old program, but it was probably you that got me started with EWTN. <laughs> I'll send you the cassette tape. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. God bless you. See you next week.